also the people online. And uh, following yesterday's teaser, um, we have uh, discovered that these fluctuations uh, in uh, magnetized me medium, magnetized fluid, like uh, the interstellar medium, uh, are not supposed to be actually static. Um, they evolve, so we do expect that what we identify like these scattering centers, uh, quote unquote, in the sense that we are talking about collisionless phenomena, these scattering centers move, hmm? are expected to move. So this is not accounted uh, for in the, in the formalism that we have used till now. So let's see what are the main effects uh, of accounting for these motions. Uh, now, this is just a sketch. Huh? You can do it in a much more detailed way, but I will focus on a couple of, uh, of effects which are relevant. So um, first, let's assume that the motion of these scattering centers, uh, these fluctuations in the magnetic field, is coherent, hmm? so that we can identify a, a field uh, of velocity which depends on space. In principle, this can depend on time as well. Uh, it doesn't change very much what I'm going to say, but um, usually the time scale over which this evolves are very slow compared to the microphysics, so I, I, I neglect the time dependence. And then uh, what people do uh, is to analyze the distribution function, the equation that we wrote for f, huh? remember our collisionless Boltzmann equation, F was dependent of time, position, and the momentum of the particle. It turns out that if the scattering center moves with the velocity u, um, the, the, the most transparent way to describe the evolution of the distribution function in with respect to momentum is to consider the momentum measured with respect to these moving scattering centers. Okay. Oh, sorry, there is an F here. <coughs> so in a certain sense, what I'm saying is that instead of defining the velocity of the cosmic rays V uh, in the lab, it's customary to define a, a, a velocity, let's denote it with a, an under uh, bar, uh, measured with respect to this scattering center movement. Okay? And correspondingly, you have that the, 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 uh, the momentum huh, is related to the, uh, the momentum uh, in, the, in, in the lab frame. Uh, minus E U, okay? Now, um, this is a hybrid and it's a non-inertial uh, transformation. So basically what I'm going to say is that instead of using the, Bolz uh, the, the collisionless Boltzmann equation for F, I'm rather interested in writing the equation for F bar, which is a function of T, uh, X, and uh, this P bar. Hmm? which is nothing but actually f of t, x, and then uh, this function, but now written in terms of uh, p under bar plus e u. Okay? That's it. So just let's plug this into our collisionless uh, equation and see what happens. Hmm? Now, um, I'll, I'll simplify a bit the problem in the sense that I will forget for a moment about this term, the force term. Um, it doesn't mean that there are no changes in this force term, but the most important change is something that uh, requires uh, a, a, a discussion afterwards because this approximation of coherent motion is not actually very faithful to what happens in nature. So let's consider for the moment that this is not changing, this piece, so I will neglect it and then I will tell you just what happens, what's the dominant effect that happens in changing this term, okay? Um, 
So basically now you see that when I do, uh, okay, the derivative of f or the derivative of f bar with respect to time is the same. Hmm? Plus x dot through this relation, I can rewrite just as v underscore plus u hmm? scalar f bar. But there is another term that comes from the fact that now p under a bar depends on x through u. Okay? So I have to account for that. Huh? These are not any more canonically conjugated uh, variables. Okay? So I have another term which writes v plus u scalar Let's write in a component uh, notation so that this is the height component, the f in principle, the p uh, uh, j bar, the p bar j with respect to x i. Zero. Hmm? Now, there is this relation the derivative of p j, the bar, the new variable, with respect to x i is equal to minus e derivative with respect to x i of u j. And then what I'm going to do is to neglect terms quadratic or higher order in u because I'm going to make the assumption that this u is non-relativistic. Okay, so this is, a, this is very well uh, why this so. I told you what is the typical values of this u. Huh? u here, which is in general, but this we expect to be of the Alvan wave. Huh? And the Alvan wave is, I don't know, maybe 1 to uh, 30 kilometers per second. That's the typical numbers that you have in the galactic medium. So this is way below the velocity, the speed of light. Huh? So forget about quadratic and higher order terms, and I will do it from, 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 from now on, this non-relativistic approximation. Okay? Uh, at the moment when I, I can basically neglect the, the higher order terms, I can replace the f over the p bar with the f bar with, p, uh, with respect to p. So at the end of the day, what I get is the f plus v plus u scalar x f bar minus p bar i d u over d x i uh, times d f bar d p bar j plus the force term equal to zero. Okay? And this is approximate in the sense that it's only valid at leading order in U. And that's it, hmm? in the sense that this is what should replace our spatial transport term if instead of using F, we want to use this weird description uh, where we measure momenta with respect to the, to, the, um, to the frame of the scattering centers, which we are assuming are moving coherently. Um, and uh, you see that there are new terms that appear. In particular, there is this u uh, cross gradient, and there is this new term, which is weird. It's not there if u does not depend on space. Huh? Uh, and I will comment on what this leads to in a second. Uh, from now on, we can repeat what we did yesterday. Okay? I can rewrite, you know, I can do the ensemble average of f. Huh? And then I can decompose f in multiples so that I write this as phi bar plus 3 p hat scalar uh, phi vector underscore. Hmm? I can do the same thing. And if I do this, I get exactly the same result as yesterday, plus, of course, the new terms that have appeared. Okay? So, and not repeat the whole passage with the two coupled equation for, sorry, 
this is little fee. Huh? Okay, so at the end, you end up with this equation. Minus derivative with respect to x, i, this is what we wrote yesterday, huh? okay, i, j, derivative with respect to x, j of phi. Huh? But there are new terms, and these new terms are plus u, i, derivative with respect to x, i of phi bar. And then there is another term. Mm, this is a divergence of this new, uh, vector field. P bar derivative with respect to P bar of phi. Everything equal to zero. This is what you would get if you repeat what we did yesterday. Um, now, what are these new terms? This guy is an advective or convective term which describes the transport of cosmic rays going with the wind, as the movie says. Okay? If you have a wind, there is a term in the transport of cosmic rays that is just the transport coherently with the wind that is maybe leaving the galaxy up and down. Hmm? That's what it describes. So you s it has this typical sh shape you know, of a transport derivative. This plus this, huh? this looks like a transport der derivative. Um, this term here is more interesting, if perhaps. Hmm? This is a divergence of the U field. And this makes uh, appear a derivative of momentum. So this couples a special effect on the motion of this plasma, of the scattering centers, with an internal change in the energy distribution, the momentum distribution of the particles. So this is known as adiabatic term. And this is analogous, if you want to remember what it does, think of a gas. What happens if you compress a gas? Naively, it heats up. If you rarefy a gas, it cools down. This is what this term does. If you have a converging uh, velocity field, it will accelerate particles. If you have a diverging velocity field, it will slow down particles. Okay? So this is an important term because for the first time, we see one mechanism that can do something clever, namely transform macroscopic kinetic energy into microscopic uh, internal energy of our gas of cosmic rays. Hmm? Now, I told you that I will forget in this, in this derivation what happens to the, to the force term. And I also assume that this U is a coherent field. Hmm? So all scattering center move with the same velocity in, uh, in my lab frame, which is the galaxy. Huh? For instance, my magnetic field is escaping up and down from the galaxy with a wind. This is not always a faithful description of what happens. And uh, there are many situations where you have a non-negligible dispersion of velocities of the scattering centers. So you might think again, like in our analogy yesterday of the molecules in a room, you may have a coherent motion huh? and you may have a random motion of the scattering centers. Now, if you have a random motion of your scattering centers, there is no way you can identify a single transformation where you go at rest in the frame of the scattering center. At best, you can go at rest with respect to the average motion of the scattering centers. But there will be some residual motion of these scattering centers, even in this frame. Now, if you have magnetic fluctuations, magnetic inhomogeneities, and they are not frozen in time, but they are moving, these unavoidably are associated to electric fields. So no matter what, if you have this velocity dispersion, even measuring stuff with respect to the frame of the plasma, the scattering flame, you will have electric fields, fluctuating, stochastic electric fields. And electric fields can change momenta. Huh? They are associated to a force that can change momenta. Okay? So what I neglected, huh? the main correction to this 
thing that comes from this effect is to add at the right, right hand side, if you wish, of this term, another term which is a stochastic effect of this residual motion, sorry, derivative with respect to P. Uh, from now on, let me, this is the last time I use the bar on P, but you should always mean that P is measured with respect to the uh, uh, plasma frame. Otherwise, this notation becomes really too cumbersome. Huh? Um, this is P square KPP. Not surprisingly, huh, what these random electric fields do is to induce a diffusion term. This is nothing but a diffusion term written in spherical coordinates. Huh? Um, so you have an evolution. Sorry. I said last time this is P bar. Uh, and this diffusion term, we know roughly what it should be. Right? Because now, what's the rate with which you change your momentum if your direction of momentum change was new huh? in our previous estimate? KPP will be proportional to what we call new theta theta, huh? the frequency with which in our fluctuating magnetic fields you change your direction of momentum, just that you have a, a E square and also effect. And then, of course, this must be proportional to the variance uh, to the second moment of the fluctuations in the, in the scattering center. Sorry, this should be delta u square. Hmm? So if u is not just a regular field, but there is a stochastic part of this field. So I won't prove that. There are references if you want. But it makes perfect sense that if you have now a stochastic field, then you should have a diffusion uh, 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 electric field, which is now changing the momentum, because this is an electric field. Huh? So it can change the momentum. So you see that in this type of uh, framework, where the scattering centers are moving, uh, our transport equation for cosmic rays has enriched with new terms. One is more is sort of spatial only, and the other two terms uh, uh, relate to the momentum evolution of our cosmic ray distribution. So uh, this term here is known as reacceleration. It's a name. Why reacceleration? Because in principle, in principle, if we didn't know about astrophysics, from a theoretical perspective, we could imagine that this is, for instance, the term that is responsible for producing the spectra, non-thermal spectra that we see. It turns out, and this is a distributed term, so this depends on the distribution in the space of propagation of all these fluctuating inhomogeneities. It turns out that this is not enough. Quantitatively, that's not what is responsible, we find, for um, the spectra of cosmic rays. It's a sort of subleading effect which happens on the top of the main acceleration mechanism. That's why it's called reacceleration. So the picture that astrophysicists have in mind is that uh, there are sites at which the bulk of the acceleration gets uh, done. Then from these sites, cosmic rays propagate everywhere in the interstellar medium. But while propagating, they are subject to this further reprocessing in momentum space. Uh, and this is called reacceleration. Okay? Um, we will see another perspective on this term, because this is a sort of... Uh, statistical description of this term, more microscopic one, which is actually closer to what Fermi had in mind to explain the acceleration of cosmic rays. So uh, uh, um, stand with me for a, for, for a while. I will show you a more particle uh, description of microscopic description of this term shortly. Um, so one thing that I propose to do uh, as a more advanced exercise, it won't be discussed tomorrow, but you have all the tools to do it is to solve the 1D uh, 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 diffusion equation, taking into account at least these two terms, not this last one. Uh, there is a reference to a paper where uh, you find nice mathematical solutions uh, uh, um, associated to, 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 to this term as well. But a simplified model where you have just 1D As promised, now I don't have bars anymore because I... Huh? 
dz minus one third du over dz p d phi over dp equal q and uh, you can solve it in the in the usual infinite sandwich uh, situation where u is just constant here constant here uh, there is a jump at z equals zero um, and you will st if you perform this exercise you will find a solution which in the plane uh, phi of z equals zero p can be still written as the source term as a function of momentum time an effective propagation time scale which depends on momentum just it has a more complicated form than what you saw yesterday with Sylvia uh, uh, which was just a diffusion time scale now this guy will depend also on u and will depend on u and k in an integral way mm? so if you are curious I give you also the the, the general solution of the first order inhomogeneous equation. So you really have to plug the, the, the numbers into the general solution and you find it. And if you want to go beyond, you can write a little Python code. So you need some numerical integration. Huh? Uh, and just compare, if you are curious, maybe next week or whatever, this solution with the solution that was discussed in detail yesterday, huh? where this is diffusive of P, so you can just limit yourself to compare these two time scales and you will see that they will agree in a certain range of p. So the question for you, are they agreeing at high p? Are they agreeing at low p? And this should give you some intuition of when these convective type of things are important, for instance. Okay. So after this technical uh, parenthesis, I will resume uh, uh, on the on the more uh, the deeper general problem, which is how do we accelerate cosmic rays? I just told you that this term there, the reacceleration terms, is not going to be enough. Hmm? Basically, just smooths out in momentum <laughs> spectrum. Uh, just by looking at it, if you solve for this simple equation without all the other terms. You just inject a monochromatic spectrum in momentum and you look at what this term does, it will broaden it in momentum space. Huh? It will make a Gaussian broader in momentum space. That's what this term does. Uh, but that's not what it looks like, right? We have a spectra which are power low type of spectra. They don't look like broad Gaussian type of spectra. So by eye, this cannot be the one responsible for the bulk of it. Not quite. I will show you how you can accommodate it, but by eye, it's not what you expected. Uh, so what are the key problems involved in the, in the acceleration of cosmic rays? Uh, if you want to be schematics, you need a few ingredients if you want to be able to accelerate cosmic rays. One ingredient that you need, you need to provide energy. Okay? These are energetic particles whose average energy are way above the thermal energies in the medium. So you must have a source of energy that is drained into the cosmic ray uh, energy. So energetics is the first thing. Hmm? Now, do you have energetic sources in the universe? Of course, a lot. You may have uh, eventually gravitational energy, for instance, from collapse of stars, uh, or from uh, uh, accretion of, uh, um, uh, onto black holes. Huh? Uh, you may have magnetic energy. Uh, you may have uh, kinetic energy. Shock waves in supernova, they carry kinetic energy. Okay? So energetics, uh, we, we have lots of uh, energetic uh, uh, systems. Um, although there is an exercise that you will see tomorrow among the ones proposed, uh, where you know the kind of requirements to power the cosmic rays are quite extreme. So in fact, you don't have thousands of possible sources for cosmic rays. Huh? So I will um, motivate how supernova remnants in particular seem to be uh, one of the best shots that we have in the galaxy at least to accelerate these guys. Um, the, the another another important requirement is confinement. This applies, by the way, these things apply even for man-made accelerators. 
you have still to provide some energy source. Without a, a, a power source, CERN cannot run. And there is a little power plant uh, next to, to CERN, by the way, if you visit CERN, huh? because you need power. And that's also why uh, affecting the time at which CERN runs, because this power plant is used sometimes to power the city of Geneva as well. Huh? Uh, two, well, you have um, confinement. What does it mean, confinement? It means that you must keep your particles within your accelerator. If you have a mechanism for accelerating particles, but as soon as you start accelerating your particle, the particles flies away out of your acceleration zone, doesn't work. Huh? So you must confine them. At CERN, they use magnetic fields to confine these particles. And nature also uses magnetic fields to confine these particles. Hmm? Another criterion is uh, E losses, so energy losses, or rather lack of large energy losses. It serves you nothing if you can accelerate particles, but then in the same environment, you lose energy so, so quickly that basically energetic particles don't survive long. Huh? Um, so you see, these requires powerful sources. These rather requires rarefied objects. You don't want to have high target densities. Huh? You don't want to have too high uh, matter density. You don't want to have too high photon density, and so on and so forth. And we will focus more on in energy losses tomorrow. Um, Confinement is related to what is known as um, a Hilla's criterion. This is the most, um, the most famous um, confinement requirement. So basically, this is equivalent to require that the Larmor radius hmm, uh, is going to be uh, 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 smaller than the size of your accelerator. Otherwise, as soon as the particle is gyrating, basically gets out of the accelerator. Okay, the Larmor radius is nothing but basically rigidity over magnetic field below S, which means that the product B times S is going to determine the upper limit to the rigidity that you can achieve. Okay, so what Hillas, a, a British uh, physicist, uh, did quite some decades ago was to plot in a log size versus log B plane, a number of sources, let's say supernova remnants and, and whatever, uh, uh, lobes of uh, active galactinuclei, et cetera, et cetera. In this plane, basically, constant uh, rigidities are represented by diagonal lines like this. Huh? And objects that are only objects that are above, so these may be, I don't know, 10 to the 15 gigavolt, these can be 10 to the 17 gigavolt, these can be 10 to the 20 gigavolts, and so on and so forth. Only objects, this is a necessary condition, it's not sufficient, but only objects that are to the, uh, above these lines, huh, to the upper right corner of this plot, can accelerate in principle, can confine. So, a fortiori can accelerate particles up to the corresponding rigidity. So if you do that, hmm, and you plot, for instance, supernova remnants, you will discover that the product of B times S, naively at least, because there are other phenomena that can kick in, but naively, uh, is below the line of roughly 10 to the 16 electron volt. So, for protons which means that since we have observed cosmic rays up to 10 to the 20 electron volt or so, clearly supernova remnants, which are the ones I'm going to focus in the next part of the lecture, are probably okay for the bulk of the low energy part of cosmic rays, the ones that are measured directly uh, by AMS and so on, but certainly seem to fall short of the requirements to achieve very high energy uh, cosmic ray energy. So, ultra energy cosmic rays, the kind of stuff OG or telescope arrays measuring, probably come from some other type of object. Okay? Um, so, the, 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 the requirement which is maybe less trivial and more new for, for you is, is the E transfer, sorry. So even if you have energy, 
That's the example I was giving the first day. Huh? At LHC, you don't get particles accelerated to TV energies by just burning coal. Even if you burn a lot of coal, that's not, to go <laughs> that's not going to be a very efficient way to accelerate them. So it's not only the amount of energy. You need to have a mechanism that is capable of transferring macroscopic energy into this microscopic uh, energy of the uh, distribution function of cosmic rays. And this is the, the least trivial uh, condition and the one on which, for instance, Fermi was uh, thinking about after, just after World War II. Now, in astrophysics, typically you have freely moving charges. Hmm? So virtually all astrophysical media, or almost all astrophysical media, are, um, contain some plasma, some ionization fraction, which is non-vanishing which means that if you have an electric field, very soon this will be a, a shortcut. Huh? So it will be neutralized by the fact that the, free, the, the charges can move freely and so will compensate whatever charge displacement you have uh, produced. It's not exact, there are some exceptions to that, but roughly that's, that's, that's correct. So um, it's very hard in astrophysical media to have a, a, a standing a non-transient electric field, okay? So the only way you can do that, uh, but you need electric fields to have accelerate, uh, acceleration, at least unless you have exotic phenomena, like for instance, heavy particles that decay, of course, then they can accelerate these particles through other uh, mechanisms, huh? mediated by whatever new physics mediates the decay. And it's fair to say that there is, even within the standard model, some non-electromagnetic acceleration mechanism. Huh? Think of alpha or beta decay. You can get energetic particles out, but this is coming from strong or weak forces. Huh? However, fair to say, there are very rare cases in astrophysics where this is very relevant, and all cases of practical interest involve the electromagnetic force. But electromagnetic force of which type? Electric fields. Magnetic fields cannot change the momentum of your particles. So you need electric fields. And which electric fields can you have? Typically, either you have um, some transient phenomena, hmm? or more often what people consider uh, are, um, for example, magnetic reconnection, hmm? or you have um, uh, moving magnetic fields because moving magnetic fields are associated to an electric field. Now, in which type of configurations? Astrophysicists are uh, very ingenious, so they have proposed lots of uh, environment where this can happen. I give you very quick uh, um, references uh, in the notes on a few of these. For instance, you can think of a, a highly magnetized, highly rotating uh, compact star, like a, a neutron star, uh, you have a fastly rotating magnetic field. This behaves like an unipolar inductor. Uh, and you know, those of you who have an old bike, uh, uh, know that with a rotating magnetic field, you can power your, your uh, bike lamp. Uh, so in principle, they can work in a similar way and can produce an electric field and some acceleration. Um, I won't cover that. I don't have time. Uh, uh, the most... The paradigmatic case I want to mention, however, is the case where you have um, a, a shock, a shock wave, which is again a disturbance uh, uh, in the magnetic field configuration, which is moving coherently, uh, and uh, um, happens, for instance, at supernova remnants, but not only. This happens also in pulsar wind nebula, which are the, you know, associated to the, to the uh, emission uh, uh, um, far away from the, 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 the pulsar uh, light cone. Um, now, I don't know how many of you have seen shocks uh, in hydrodynamics or other uh, uh, courses, more basic courses. They might look exotic. Maybe so some of you have heard uh, uh, shocks for a, a supersonic plane passing by. Uh, so, in general, um, if you have a disturbance in a medium that propagates faster than the sound wave in that medium, then you have a, a discontinuity. 
in uh, macroscopic variables like density and pressure and so on. And this is what we call a shock wave. Hmm? Um, the same, actually you can think in some sense of the Cherenkov cone as a, a light analog of this, uh, if you have ever seen pictures of that in, for muons, for instance, in, in pools. Um, now, um, w it's a physical realization of a discontinuity, uh, which means in, in nature there is nothing that is zero or infinity. Uh, so it means just that, you, for instance, you have a change in the density rho uh, uh, across some surface. Uh, so this, this is a shock wave propagating that way. So this is typical. The environment which has not been reached yet by the shock wave is called uh, 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 upstream. Uh, and the environment behind the shock wave is downstream. Uh, so what does it mean that you expect that uh, this function is regular here, is regular here, and here there is some discontinuity. Now the discontinuity in principle in the limit where this is uh, infinitely thin uh, is, is a mathematical discontinuity. Of course, uh, in physics, what happens is that just this thickness is very, very small compared to the macroscopic scale, and the thickness of this uh, surface is, is actually determined by microphysics, but which typically is really a few atomic lengths. Huh? Uh, so basically, for macroscopic purposes, we model it as a, as a, as a surface. Um, of course, you might say, how particular, how singular should conditions be for these type of things to happen? And the answer is, if you have looked into hydrodynamics uh, textbooks or lambda, for instance, it's surprisingly common. Huh? So most likely, all of you have seen the sound wave uh, 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 derivation that I, I sketched yesterday. But few of you have seen what happens if you have waves of finite amplitude. If you have a wave which is not infinitesimal, but it's a wave of finite amplitude, under rather general condition, you may have a situation where your, your wave, while propagating, goes through a situation where the crest of the wave propagates faster than, I mean, mathematically, you will get something that your crest of the wave propagates faster than the bottom part. Uh, this is a, sit a typical condition where a shock wave, in fact, forms, sort of discontinuity of this, of this sort. And these are rather common in nature. So you don't need to arrange them in very special condition. Okay? Um, now, what are the laws that determine the physics at these uh, shocks? Essentially, we might ignore the microphysics, but we still know that the general principle should apply. The conservation of matter, the conservation of momentum, the conservation of energy. Huh? Just if you have a discontinuity, the way we describe these things are not anymore through differential equations, uh, Euler equation or, or a continuity equation, are rather through um, uh, jump conditions. Uh, conditions that tell us what's the link between, say, the density here and the density here, the velocity here and the velocity here. Okay? Which one to apply depends on whatever continuum mechanic system you are considering. For instance, for pure hydro hydrodynamics, and in this literature, you find often this type of notation, brackets O, it just means O, uh, uh, say, o, uh, o D minus O U, O1 minus O2. It's just the jump on some quantity O. Huh? That's how it is uh, denoted. So. Um, let me write, for instance, the most simple case of um, jump conditions that you might have seen if you have studied shocks in the past. Or not, I don't know. <laughs> so the, um, the continuity equation is just replaced by, by this condition. Or let's use U if we want to use the, the, the same convention as before. Uh, the momentum conservation equation across the shock corresponds to this condition. This is the pressure, equal to zero. And then you have an energy conservation equation that in the specific case of a uh, monatomic gas, uh, 
with adiabatic index gamma. For, for monatomic gas, the adiabatic index is five thirds. Uh, would, would write like this. This is not very important in quantitative details, but just to give you an idea of what does it mean to have jump conditions. Uh, <coughs> so this means, basically, that rho upstream times uh, uh, the velocity upstream must be equal to rho downstream times velocity downstream. That's what it means. Hmm? Um, now, if you solve this system of equation, these are just hydrodynamical. Here there are no B fields. Huh? These are just hydrodynamical uh, um, conditions. In particular, these ones are ranking uh, Huguenot uh, conditions. They are called by like that. Uh, let me just write what, what they give you for, for this quantity, and you have in the notes also the same for temperature or pressure. Basically, they imply uh, that uh, these things here imply that rho downstream over rho upstream is equal to v up, sorry, u upstream over u downstream. Uh, is also equal to gamma plus one m square. I introduce this new quantity, gamma minus one m square plus two, and this m is just the, the the velocity of the shock over the sound speed, and it's known as Mach number. Okay, if you have a very large Mach number. This goes to gamma plus one over gamma minus one. And in particular for an, an hydrogen gas system, this is four. Huh? So for a very fast shock in a medium made of hydrogen, you expect that there is a jump of density of a factor four. So the density behind the shock is higher by a factor four than the density of the medium the shock is crossing, and the velocity slows down. So the velocity behind the shock is lower than the velocity uh, ahead. Um, you can write the same type of conditions for, uh, for a system where there are magnetic fields. Mm? And you will get, maybe you have seen this type of things in electromagnetism, where you studied the, 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 the conditions you have to apply at the interface of a surface uh, for the, the, the parallel and orthogonal component of a field. The same happens here. So you must have some requirements for the, uh, for the conservation of what is called the, the parallel component of the magnetic field. It's a bit misleading. It's parallel to the normal to the surface which actually is orthogonal to the surface. Huh? So the parallel component is this one, and the orthogonal component is this one. So the parallel component of the field obeys uh, this jump condition, the B field, and, uh, and the orthogonal component of the electric field, namely the one parallel to the surface, is also co uh, conserved. Um, and you get the same ratio, for instance, for the B field. So B parallel is also subject to this ratio four. So this is just to tell you that once you have a shock, think of an infinitely uh, thin planar shock, uh, you have a factor four jump in density, uh, one fourth basically in the, in, the, in the velocity, and you have a factor four as well in the magnetic field. So you have an announcement of the magnetic field uh, across the shock. Now, this is a parenthesis, and it's my uh, five minutes of uh, hydrodynamics. Uh, and uh, let's apply these, plus the equations that we have seen, uh, to, uh, to what is the expected acceleration that you have in a supernova remnants, which we ide idealize as an infinitely thin uh, uh, planar shock. Huh? And what's the idea? Let me um, scoop the, 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 the idea. The idea is to try to use that term that I wrote there to do something useful for the acceleration, the adiabatic energy transfer term. Huh? Because now I have a system in nature where I can make the velocity field change in space huh? through this discontinuity. Maybe 
I can uh, make it work to accelerate cosmic rays. That's the idea. Hmm? So let's see if it works for the system of supernova remnants. What is my mathematical supernova remnants? This is an, a, a plane. Huh? Uh, I am in the frame of the, uh, of the shock. I have, uh, let's say, this is the, 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 the z direction. This is zero. Huh? So these are negative z, these are positive z. This is behind the shock, so downstream. This is uh, before the shock, upstream. Okay? Um, and uh, in this frame, let's call, I don't know, u1 the velocity here. Uh, and u2 the velocity here, and we know what are the, uh, the, 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 basically we know that these differ by factor 4 uh, because of the jump condition. And I want to look at a, a, a steady state solution of that equation where I neglect the reacceleration term. Uh, so I just have uh, basically these three terms, diffusion, uh, advection, and adiabatic term. Uh, uh, in this simple case, there is a discontinuity here at z equals zero, and in each of these two pl uh, uh, half planes, u and k are constant. Okay? So if I put myself, for instance, in the negative half plane, uh, the last term is zero, huh? because u is constant, so this, the derivative is zero, and I have to balance for a steady state case, the d phi over dt is equal to zero, I have to balance advection and diffusion. Okay? So my equation reduces to u derivative with respect to uh, z, sorry, phi equal to derivative with respect to z, k phi, okay? And I want to impose some uh, suitable boundary conditions, whatever is the flux at infinity. Huh? For instance, if I have the flux at infinity, uh, which is zero, I would have that in, why this doesn't write? No. Little phi huh? is equal, in general, this would be phi minus infinity of P, sorry. Uh, plus phi zero of p. This is the same convention you used yesterday, so it's the flux at the interface, uh, at zero, minus phi minus infinity of p, times, you can check, exponential minus absolute values of z, u1 uh, over k1. This just comes from integrating that. You can find a z-dependent function where you balance uh, advection and uh, diffusion, which means that in special uh, um, terms, uh, my, my distribution function will go exponentially uh, to the asymptotic value away from the shock. Uh, and the typical length of this is k1 over u1. What happens in the positive alt plane? In that case, you see that you would naively get the same solution, but with a growing uh, sign here, which is diverging, so it's unphysical. So the only acceptable solution that you have in this alt plane, in this idealized case, is that phi is constant. Hmm? <coughs> so in the other, this is valid for z less than zero, and the one that is valid for f um, for for um, z larger than zero is just this condition. And just with the same method that we used yesterday, now we want to, we want to uh, integrate basically our equation around this discontinuity to determine this function phi zero of p. If you do that, you get this type of conditions, derivative with respect to z of phi, and two minus k derivative with respect to z phi in one, plus 
one third u um, two minus u one times p derivative of phi with respect to p equal to whatever source term q zero of p I have at the surface of this continuity. Hmm? Now this is a, a constant term, so this is zero. This does depends on z, so we can take the derivative; it's finite. So you will get something like minus u1 phi 0 plus 1 third u2 minus u1 uh, p d phi 0 over dp equal q0 of p. This is an inhomogeneous uh, uh, first order differential equation. You have a general solution. You have it in the note. And if we Let's assume a test spectrum for the injection. Huh? Um, so a test spectrum means that I am going to inject some monochromatic uh, particle. So Q0, I write like K. K is just a constant for normalization, which means that this prefactor is arbitrary. It's just written for, for uh, practical uh, purposes, U1, P1. Delta, sorry, PI, let's call injection, P minus PI. The important part is this one. I'm saying that this is, I don't know what this PI is. Is whatever momentum particles are present at, at, at uh, the shock, okay? So this is unknown for the time being. And this is just a normalization constant, which I write this way because I want to isolate some dimension full factors, but. Hmm? So if you plug this guy into the general solution for this differential equation that you have in the notes, huh, you can have that the solution is just written like that. Phi zero P is equal to three K R over R minus one times P over P I minus three R over R minus one. Uh, and R is nothing but the ratio of U one over U two, which we know would tend to four in the limit of a strong shock. Strong shock means large Mach number. Mach number much larger than one, okay? So let's look at what we have found. Hmm? First of all, we have no idea what is the injection momentum of these particles. However, we have found a power law spectrum resulting from this uh, uh, acceleration mechanism, okay? What's the index of this power law? It's basically p to the minus four uh, in momentum space. If you like, like our experimentalist friend, to present things in terms of flux, spectral intensity, etc., you would find something that goes as p to the minus two or energy to the minus two, because there is a p square factor, remember, in the f and n that we have yesterday, which is what people call Fermi spectrum, hmm? e to the minus two. Actually, this is not fully exact. There is a small uh, correction to that that depends on the square of the Mach number. So the true prediction would be something like uh, e to the minus 2.x, 2 point epsilon, with this epsilon that depends on the exact value of the Mach uh, number in these shocks. But for very strong shocks, let's say Mach number of even, even five, you have corrections that are a few percent with respect to the spectral index, okay? Second thing, if you sum spectra of this form, uh, you still get a spectrum of this form, uh, independently of what is this normalization and this injection index. Which means that fortunately for us, even if we don't know what happens in the injection, and even if we don't know what is the amount of particles that are being accelerated, the result is universal in terms of spectral shape, which is great because we have no idea actually of what's going on there. Third, diffusion is essential, but this result does not depend on the diffusion coefficient. Now I challenge you to measure the diffusion coefficient in a supernova remnant. It's extremely hard. Fortunately, this prediction does not depend on that value. It's crucial that particles diffuse there because we solved the diffusion equation. But the, the, the result does not depend on the diffusion coefficient. There are some things that depend on the diffusion coefficients. For instance, the skin length, uh, the exponential uh, scale over which your particle 
distribution goes to zero. So if you are very sensitive and you have, I don't know, whatever, some X-ray uh, detector that is capable of looking at the profile of some tracer of the particles, in principle, you can measure that. But in general, it's very hard, and certainly not from what we get at the Earth. Um, and then, okay, there are some limitations. One limitation is that, in principle, this guy extends to infinite momentum. But this is an idealization. I use the steady state conditions. I put derivative with respect to t equals zero. And in fact, a supernova doesn't last forever. No? It's not like diamonds in the, in the, in the marketing campaign, uh, which is false anyway. It's graphite that lasts forever, not diamonds under normal conditions. Uh, but actually, this is not true. In a finite time, you will have a maximum amount of momentum that you can reach. And we will see more clearly this in a different perspective to this problem. Uh, but ideally, in the steady state, this goes to infinity. There are no energy losses. Remember, we haven't talked about yet about collisional effects. The right-hand side of the Boltzmann equation, there is no process that we put there. It's zero. So you cannot lose energy in this system. Not surprisingly, you can accelerate up to infinite energy, and nothing happens. Um, I think this is a good moment to stop, and then we, uh, for 10 minutes, and then I resume with a complementary view of the acceleration problem, not from the macroscopic distribution of function, but from what happens to a single particle in these type of environments. So we go to the particle picture uh, point of view. Okay, let's stop here. Okay. So I promised an alternative view to the problem of uh, acceleration. Um, let me start with some general consideration. They might look a bit abstract, uh, but they can be made concrete in a specific situation uh, shortly. So imagine that there is some periodic phenomenon, some cyclic uh, phenomenon, huh? which has some characteristic time scale per cycle tau. And uh, this goes on for a sufficiently long time scale. It can be a long time scale, capital T. Huh? And at each cycle, tau, uh, a particle undergoing this cycle of acceleration, rather abstract, can gain a relative energy with respect to the initial energy, which is fixed, is energy independent psi. Okay? And uh, also, at each cycle, my particle can either stay in the site of acceleration or escape it. And it can escape it with some escape probability p -esk, which means that it stays in the site of acceleration with the complementary probability 1 plus p -esk. OK? Uh, in this simple system, what does it mean uh, that I, I, I have my particle entering and uh, uh, exiting from this cycle it means that if I have an initial energy E0, uh, after one cycle, my particle will have an energy E0, 1 plus psi, uh, and it will stay on with the probability 1 minus p escape. So after n, cycle, n cycles, there will be an energy E0, 1 plus psi to the power of n, but only with probability 1 minus p escape to the power of n. So there are fewer and fewer particles that stay longer and longer in my cycle. Okay? So in this simple and generic framework, what's the flux of particles which have an energy larger than this E huh? uh, uh, energy attained at the cycle um, n? Well, you can just sum now this discrete series. The flux of my particles will be proportional. Let's call it flux uh, greater than uh, En. Huh? This will be proportional to what? To the sum of my particles that have stayed n cycles plus the ones that have stayed n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus up to infinity. Hmm? So I can sum over m from n to infinity. In principle, if I have infinite time, otherwise I have to cut. Uh, up to the num maximum number of cycles available, um, of what? Of 1 minus p escape to the power of m. Hmm? Because the particles that have stayed m times in have a probability 1 minus p escape that have still there. Huh? 
for particles that stay 2m, this will be 1 minus pi escape to 2m. Uh, I can, this is a geometric series uh, where the x in the geometric series is 1 minus p escape, an incomplete geometric series, in the sense that, well, it starts from n, uh, in this sense. So you can sum it exactly, and this gives you 1 minus p escape to the power of n over p escape. Can take, uh, so this is en. Uh, I can solve for n from here, and I know that m, n, sorry, my n is going to be the log of e n over e0 divided by the log of 1 plus psi. Huh? So I can rewrite this guy 1 minus p escape over p escape uh, to, this, to this ratio of logs. Huh? And then I use the wonderful property that a log b is equal to b log a. And I rewrite this as 1 over p escape, which is irrelevant because I don't specify the normalization here, e to e naught to the power minus alpha. And let me write what this alpha is from using this property here. So this is n. And alpha, this we will need later, so let me write it here. Alpha is going to be the log of 1 minus p escape to the minus 1 over the log of 1 plus psi. If p escape is small and psi is small, which is basically always the case for non-relativistic uh, acceleration problems at least, uh, I can expand. And this turns out to be basically approximately uh, uh, p escape over psi. So even in this problem, I have found that at the end of the day, I have a cumulative spectrum, which is a power law. And the power law index depends on quantities which are more microscopic now, the ratio of the escape probability at each cycle to the uh, incremental gain of energy that I have in each cycle. So this is a very abstract uh, uh, notion. Of course, I will cut this power spectrum at some maximum energy E max is determined, is associated to an N max, which is basically of the order of, ta, uh, of T capital T over tau. Hmm? So I should expect, so basically E max is going to be 1 plus psi E naught, uh, and 1 plus psi is raised to this N max. So I need time to accelerate particles to some energy. Um, now, this generic mechanism is, was incarnated for the first time in a mechanism proposed by Fermi, which is actually the truly, uh, uh, the true Fermi mechanism, huh? although the previous mechanism is still called Fermi mechanism, more specifically first order Fermi mechanism, it was not proposed by Fermi. Uh, it was rather studied in the early 70s, I think. Um, this one that I'm going to present now is the one proposed by Fermi. If you open the physical review paper by Fermi, you find this one, basically. And what Fermi thought is, OK, there was a, a guy that gave a seminar in Chicago, a guy named Alven, and he claimed that there should be some waves in the interstellar medium uh, propagating with some velocity. So Fermi calls them uh, magnetic clouds, huh? but that's the same thing. And it talks of magnetoelastic uh, waves uh, and, uh, and, uh, and strains and so on. So there is this sort of waves, inhomogeneity, irregularity in the magnetic field of the galaxy, which is moving with some velocity, uh, beta, which is basically now you should know what it is. It should be of the order of the VL van over C. Hmm? And then there are these particles some with random velocities all around this. Some of them will hit this irregularity. 
they will, de they will do whatever they like inside this cloud, and at some point they will exit. So there is some initial energy EI with which they enter the cloud, and there is some final energy EF with which they exit the cloud. So the question is, is this larger than this? Yes, no, by how much? And of course, this is a st stochastic problem. So sometimes this will be larger, sometimes this will be smaller. But the clever intuition by Fermi is that in this situation, on average, it will be larger. So my particle gain energy at the expense of the kinetic energy of this cloud. Okay, so let me just sketch the, the argument. Um, by the way, Fermi also acknowledged the, the conversations with Teller on this subject. I have no idea what they were talking about concerning uh, uh, astrophysics or cosmic rays, but uh, that's what he claims in the paper. Anyway, um, so let's look at this in a very simple picture. So my particle enters the cloud. So what's the energy that my particles has in the cloud frame? Huh? This is just a, a, a boost. Huh? So my energy that I will denote with a prime initial inside the cloud can be obtained from the, uh, 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 the one uh, outside the cloud by gamma times EI times one minus beta mu, uh, where mu is the cosinus of the angle between the, the particle momentum and the velocity of the cloud. Okay, and this is a stochastic variable in the sense that this is uh, going to have all possible values in principle. Inside the cloud, if I go in the frame of the cloud, uh, this is not moving in the frame of the cloud. So any, dif any magnetic uh, uh, um, evolution process will not change my energy as seen inside the cloud because Lorentz force does not change the energy. At the end, my particles will, can will however, change direction inside the cloud, right? So it will enter here, will do whatever, and will exit. And not, let's change direction. We'll exit with another direction. Now, I don't know what, what it does, but I know that in the frame of the cloud, the particle at this point and the particle at this point must have the same energy, okay? So E final prime is equal to E initial prime. In the frame of the lab, I have to back transform this. Huh? Now, whatever this is, in, wh I mean, the velocity of the cloud with respect to the lab is beta, the velocity of the lab with respect to the cloud is minus beta. So E prime, sorry, E final in the lab frame is going to be another boost. So gamma square, E initial, one minus beta mu, this is this piece, times one plus beta, let's call mu tilde, and this is now the whatever angle formed by the exiting momentum with, with, the, uh, uh, with my cloud velocity. And now what we should do, I should compute the expectation value of this, averaging over all possible values of mu and mu tilde. Huh? Now, for mu tilde, that's uh, uh, trivial, in the sense that I have no idea what happens, so any, any type of angle is equally probable. So I have a flat distribution for mu tilde between minus one and one. I can average this with respect to mu tilde. And so I have that uh, uh, this E final minus E initial over E initial average with respect to uh, mu tilde. Uh, this will give me just gamma square. Sorry, this is really ugly. Gamma square. Uh, uh, one minus beta mu minus one. Huh? And then I have to average with respect to mu. And here is the, 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 the clever observation. If you have experience running under the rain, if you run towards the rain, you are getting more wet than uh, in the front than in your back. Huh? So there is a, a, a preferential, uh, um, um, which is equivalent to say that if you have cosmic rays and your cloud is moving, Preferentially, particles that will enter the clouds are particles that are moving opposite to the cloud rather than particles that are moving uh, ahead of it. Huh? So because of that, the probability distribution for mu uh, is not uniform. This is the exact formula. for This is called sometimes aberration, if you, aberration formula, if you have found it in 
that. We don't need actually the relativistic expression. It's enough to have the uh, V B uh, mu. It's enough to have the first order, so this is one minus beta uh, mu, and there are corrections which are quadratic in beta. Huh? So if you take this expression, you multiply times this probability distribution, you integrate between uh, minus one and one in mu, divide by the, uh, normalize correctly the probability, you get that the final xi, which is the expectation value of E final minus E initial over E initial is going to be four thirds. You can do the calculation exactly. You don't need to do the, the, the series expansion, but this is the only term that matters, plus terms of order uh, beta fourth. So you gain, on average you gain, this is a positive number. So on average you get your cosmic rays accelerated. Okay, and you can also prove that um, you should have a power law uh, under some conditions. Um, however, you don't know exactly how to predict the index of this power law because you would need to estimate what is this escape probability, what is this... Uh, um, so basically, <coughs> you would need to know the density of these clouds and their size in order to estimate the spectral index. Now, the funny thing that even Fermi uh, comments about is that not only this, we have no idea what these parameters are, but most likely they should vary, right? So it's very hard in this theory to understand why there seems to be some universality in, in accelerated um, uh, spectra. Look at what this is, actually. This is the, the, the microscopic description corresponding to a diffusion due to randomly moving scattering centers. So this is the, the particle view of that term that I called reacceleration before. Huh? So you might find people talking about second order Fermi acceleration. Second order because it's quadratic in the velocity of the cloud. Huh? That's why it's second order. I, he didn't call neither Fermi acceleration nor second order, but that's what the, the, the posterity has called it. Um, now, um, and also beta, as a value which is 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four at best. So this is a really small increment of energy per collision, per cycle. So it's very hard to go much high in energy with that, okay? So we think that this process is operational in nature, in the galaxy, but it's more like a correction to some underlying dominant process like the one in supernova remnants. Now, you can have a, uh, an alternative description of the, 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 the shock acceleration in this point of view. Huh? You might like it more, or you might like the fact that we used our uh, propagation equation to derive the spectral uh, distribution. This is a matter of taste. Nature doesn't care the, the, the mathematical framework in which you describe it. So, in fact, the formula here, the formula for uh, E final versus uh, E initial, never makes enter the uh, uh, hypothesis of, of, you know, how this cloud is distributed. We only make it enter when we say that mu tilde is uniformly distributed or when mu uh, must obey to this form. So I can still use, imagine that I have a, I can still use the same formula to describe what happens if instead of having ran randomly moving clouds, I have some coherent front. So a shock wave, if you wish, you can think of it like an ensemble of little perturbations that are, however, moving coherently, okay? Um, if they are moving coherently, it means that for particles to enter this cycle of acceleration, particles must enter only in this direction. Huh? Particles cannot enter from this direction. And the other point is that um, they can only exit that way. Huh? The, uh, 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 so from upstream, they must enter this way. From downstream, they go that way, which is equivalent to say that the supernova remnant is going to give you uh, geometric boundaries to the values that this mu and mu tilde must, can attain for the particle to enter the cycle. So basically what I'm saying is that for in order to enter in this convention, this mu, this angle must be negative. Huh? The shock goes there, the particle goes there. Uh, so basically, we must have that mu must be below zero, 
and you can have it uniform between minus one and zero. Remember that mu is a cosinus. Huh? And mu tilde is only positive in order for the particle to get out of your, of your um, uh, shock front and so could possibly be subject to new cycle of acceleration. Otherwise, if mu is positive, uh, sorry, if mu is negative, it means that after the scattering, my particle goes that, that way, it never returns to the shock, so it never can go undergo a new acceleration cycle. Okay, so what you would like to have is particles that do that, then whatever, then they, they stay there, then the shock comes back, and then you enter again and again and again. That's what you want for particles to, to be subject to, to uh, uh, acceleration. So you can do the same thing. You can now integrate that expression over this distribution. Huh? Uh, basically, the mathematical form is the one that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I write down, P mu, there is a mu tilde factor coming from the projection on the, so if you have a flux, what you have to do is the project on the uh, uh, axis of the velocity so that this gives you this mu tilde um, factor. Uh, then there is the conditions that this is only between minus one and one, which you can write as theta, uh, sorry, minus one and zero, which you can write like theta mu tilde, theta uh, um, basically uh, one plus mu tilde, Sorry, mu tilde is minus mu tilde, and then for mu, you have, and then you have the normalization which gives you a factor two, because the probability must be normalized to one. And then the probability for mu instead is going to be minus two mu ah, times theta of minus mu times theta of one plus mu. So if you now take the average of this expression over that probability distribution, you will get a result which is now psi equal to four thirds beta to first order in beta, where beta is, four, is actually the difference of velocity, uh, 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 you know, uh, u1 minus u2. The difference of velocity across the shock. Mm? Now, this is first order in this shock velocity, so it's much more efficient. And you can use this simple model also to compute uh, the escape uh, 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 probability, which means that with our formula for alpha, you can use this model to compute the spectral index. Hmm? The, the, I leave the derivation for the notes, but you can, if you do that, you will find that the flux at energies larger than A has a spectrum which is e to the minus one plus four over Mach number square. If I didn't do any mistake. Hmm? Again, this is, this is the integrated sp spectrum, huh? the flux above some energy, which means that the differential energy spectrum is minus two point epsilon. We refined again the Fermi uh, spectral uh, index. So this is an alternative view to, 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 to the same process, to describe the same process, where we have, however, some more intuition of what is the maximum energy that you would expect. This eventually depends on how many cycles this, this situation lasts. So you must have an idea of how long this takes, and you can estimate the maximum energy in principle. Um, so... So far, so good. Let me just uh, conclude with some remarks, at least this, this, this branch, uh, uh, um, with some remarks on actual supernova remnants, uh, because this is, a, this is a mathematician's supernova remnant. It's clearly not a physical one. So uh, what are the typical parameters? What are the typical energies we are talking about here? So um, a supernova remnant typically, um, for instance, uh, let's assume that we are talking of a, 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 a core collapse supernova to be specific, um, it need not to be so. We believe that acceleration takes place also in, uh, in uh, thermonuclear supernovae. Huh? But to give you some scale, some energy scale, a, a core collapse supernova, so this is a very massive star that has burned in its core up to iron. There is no more way for, for the star to be supporting its own weight by thermonuclear fusion because to burn iron into heavier nuclei, you would consume 
energy rather than receive energy. That's why we have fission of heavy nuclei and not fusion of heavy nuclei. Also because we have no idea how to control fusion, but that's a different story. So this star is going to collapse. What's the energy available? It's the gravitational uh, energy of your star. If you make an approximation that this is a spherical, um, yes, uh, a spherical um, homogeneous uh, object, your, your final scale are going to be your proton-neutron star scale. Your mass is going to be of the order of, you know, the, the, the stellar masses. So this, the, the expression is three-fifth uh, G Newton mass uh, square over the radius. And this is amounting to roughly three times 10 to the 53 ergs in units that astrophysicists love, CZS units. Now, where does this energy end up uh, in? Uh, in a core collapse supernova, most of this energy, almost all of this energy, is carried away, unless the standard model is wrong, uh, uh, or there is more, is carried away by neutrinos. Neutrinos of a typical energy of, say, tens of uh, uh, MeV. Mm? And this is, for this, you should not believe me. This has been measured by an experiment, uh, several experiments, but one of these is Kamiokande, and its successor is still running, uh, Super Kamiokande, and uh, Koshiba-san got a Nobel Prize uh, for, for, for basically for this discovery. Um, these neutrinos, actually in the core of the star, even neutrinos interact so sufficiently frequently that they take time to diffuse out of this proton-neutron star. So they have a diffusive motion inside the proton-neutron star. However, once outside the former core of the star, they can almost free stream. Almost. They have a small probability of interacting. Uh, they have a probability of interacting which is about 1%. So what happens is that this star, at some point the iron nucleus is formed. It cannot sustain anymore because it runs out of fuel. So the stars start collapsing. When the stars start collapsing, it will increase the density of the material at its core, but this cannot go on forever. At some point, the density becomes so high that it becomes comparable to nuclear densities. And nuclear media are basically incompressible. So when this happens, when the star nucleus has become a giant nucleus, uh, the, the star core has become a giant nucleus with what we will become a neutron star, uh, the, the matter bounces back because it's rigid. So it bounces back, there is a shock. There is a shock that propagates outwards. Unfortunately, this shock by itself will dissipate, uh, will lose momentum in uh, how? By, uh, by photodissociating and by dissociating the nuclei that the star has spent all its life doing. So the star is going to undo most of its work over the past uh, uh, millions of uh, years. However, due to these neutrinos that are being emitted by this hot bulb, uh, which is the proton-neutron star, uh, they deposit a little bit of this gravitational energy behind the shock, and this little bit is maybe something like 10 to the 51 ergs, or maybe two, two times 10 to 51 ergs, these orders of magnitude. This is enough to revive the shock and make the stellar uh, explosion happen. Okay, so you have this amount of energy available, this amount of energy in kinetic energy of your supernova. If you convert this energy, kinetic energy, into velocity, huh, you have a velocity of a supernova which is of the order of, I don't know, 10 to the minus 2, maybe, you know, 10,000 kilometers per second, something like that. This is a benchmark. This is clearly a supersonic motion your beta is going to be 10 to the minus 2, which is much larger than 10 to the minus 5 squared. <laughs> so this is way more efficient. And then you have different type of evolutions of this supernova. At the beginning, you have a free expansion. Huh? Uh, um, so the, uh, the velocity is conserved, uh, sorry, the velocity is constant, which means that the size of your supernova uh, R of t is proportional to t and the proportionality factor is that velocity that you get from energetics argument. After a while, what happens is that uh, the supernova is being uh, will be sweeping um, a quantity of material which is comparable to, its, uh, um, to the ejecta mass. 
Hmm? When this happens, the, the evolution, it's not a sort of free expansion phase, but uh, um, it can be um, modeled by uh, the self-similar solution that a, 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 an explosion of a, an energy E in a medium of density uh, rho uh, obeys to. This solution was derived independently by two physicists, Sadov and Taylor, uh, Taylor in Britain and uh, Sadov in the former Soviet Union. And uh, I let you imagine under which conditions during World War II they were deriving this. On the tr in this translation of the Sadov's book, uh, there is a B-52 bomber. So you can imagine what kind of applications they were studying. But it's the same process. Hmm? So a nuclear explosion and a supernova remnant in a certain time frame can be modeled in a similar way. Hmm? And after that, and most super, this phase of free expansion lasts maybe a century. So typically, we don't see many supernova remnants in this phase. One exception is supernova 1987A, where basically the velocity is constant. Most of these, the supernova remnants, the nice picture that you see, are in this set of Taylor phase. Afterwards, supernova remnants, and this can last tens of thousands of years. Huh? After this phase, eventually, we are neglecting losses here, but eventually this material will start radiate, and the collisional time scale, the radiative time scale, become significant compared to the time scale of your evolution to your age. So you have to, to account for um, uh, ener uh, energy losses. So this phase of set of which has a scaling r of t proportional to t to the five uh, fifth ends. And you have a slower evolution that goes as r to the, uh, sorry, t to the one fourth. This is a constant momentum type of evolution. It's also known as snowplow phase uh, because matter is being accumulated behind the shock. And this can last much longer. It can last maybe hundreds of thousands of years, maybe million year time scale until eventually uh, the, the, the supernova remnant disso dissolves into the interstellar medium and maybe triggers star formation activity. So the stellar death uh, becomes uh, uh, um, one of the triggers for new uh, stellar formations. Uh, so this is just to give you an idea of the scales of energy and the scales of time of the process. Now we have the typical supernova that we see are in this set of phase which lasts tens of thousands of years. Now we should compare these tens of thousands of years with the millions of years that the propagation time scale takes. Uh, so that justifies why we can factorize the problem into a fast acceleration phase and a slow propagation phase. Okay? Um, <coughs> and uh, an another exercise that I propose for tomorrow, you will see, uh, just um, uses this type of input. By the way, how many supernovas there are in our galaxy per century? Roughly maybe two per century, that's our estimate. Uh, um, based with the, on these energetics, these rates, uh, 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 Sylvia will help you show that actually this type of phenomenon can power the cosmic rays. So the energetics conditions can be met, uh, even if only some fraction of the kinetic energy is sort of converted into, um, into um, um, how to say, uh, acceleration of particles. Okay, so I conclude with my teaser. So what are we going to talk about uh, tomorrow? Tomorrow we are going to talk about collisions. So we start seeing that we need to take into account these collisions because there are plenty of interesting phenomena, including the acceleration. Till now I didn't include collisions, so particles will lose energy. So it's not only enough to accelerate it. A particles, you must make, make sure that you don't lose too much energy. Um, just as a, a, a general classification of what kind of uh, collisions we are going to treat. First, I'm going to, um, so that's the teaser. First, I'm going to give you some generalities on the collisions. Uh, so, collisional processes. Um, so, in collisions, uh, I will try to justify why the kind of collisions we care about are the ones that are, uh, uh, let's call them soft, mostly. Uh, so these are collisions in a different regimes from the collisions you might have studied at LHC for production of nonparticles. I will try to explain quickly why. Uh, then we will also um, uh, 
uh, introduce some notions, some notions that probably you have, the mean free path, the interaction rate, the energy loss rate, the energy loss range, things like that. Uh, and these are useful to, to gauge uh, different processes, how much they contribute uh, to each other. And then I will sketch, in the notes you have more material, but I will just sketch what are the main processes that are relevant for leptons, which means electrons, interacting with radiation, magnetic fields, and matter. And the same for hadrons, interacting with either matter or uh, radiation. And then we will just incorporate these to the right-hand side of our Boltzmann equation, because I left the collisional term pending, putting to zero ten, uh, temporarily. And then we will write uh, the, you know, the, the, the diffusion loss uh, equation in its full glory. And that's the one type of equation that you find solved numerically in codes like Galprop. Okay? And then that will be more or less the final part because the only remaining things I want to mention you are A, the limitations of this treatment. This is something people don't tell you, but you should not use these tools blindly. You should know what is included in these tools and what is not included in these tools. And second, I will, in the final lecture, give you uh, an idea of the multi-messenger perspective. So I will bring a link between cosmic rays, charged cosmic rays, and neutral secondaries, photons and neutrinos, and see how you can do maybe even some new physics searches with these tools. So that's the menu. Okay? See you tomorrow.